So tonight we um, continue on with the Negro Leagues, the end of it essentially, and of course the emergence of um, desegregation of Major League Baseball. Um, so I called it the topsy-turvy world. 1939 to 1954. And it was pretty turbulent time. Jeez, God. <clears throat> so the heyday of, of the Negro Leagues was essentially 1920 and 1939. Please understand, I know Tyler knows this and he can speak to this anytime he wants to, that when you're talking about the Negro Leagues and the various teams, there's a lot of fluidity here. And although you can say in general, these were the glory days of, of the Negro Leagues, um, that, you know, there was more than one league and leagues came and went quickly. Um, some teams only last a year or two at most. And then, you know, somebody buys them out or absorbs them and it, it goes on. And I think that's probably one of the challenges of, um, shifting statistics from the Negro Leagues to, to the major leagues as, as they have now done. And I hope that many of you ha had the opportunity to check out that link that I included last week on Tyler's piece of, of yeah. the Negro Leagues. It's a very good piece and it's not, I recommend it. And this week I did include um, the, uh, his piece on Henry Aaron, which is just moving for me anyway. Mm. So... This was the first World Series of the uh, Negro Leagues, uh, Kansas City Monarchs versus Hilldale, which was not part of the quote unquote Negro League, but uh, the Eastern League, which lasted for a short time. But just as they are reaching their peak, along comes World War II. Um, turbulent time for everyone and um, African-Americans uh, were caught up in it as much as anyone else and were as patriotic as, as um, the white population and wanted to serve. Um, and unfortunately, the Selective Service Act of 1940 uh, was essentially a status quo decision. FDR felt, who was president at the time, that um, he did not want to risk social turmoil uh, by integrating the uh, armed service just as they're getting ready to go to war. Since, you know, there were plenty of people in the so-called America First movement led by people like Earl Lindbergh who didn't think that Hitler was such a bad guy and um, that, you know, we shouldn't be engaged in what was going on in Europe and that we had a notion to separate us and, and protect us. Um, African-Americans enlisted in the same percentages as the white population, um, but their units were going to be segregated or would continue to be segregated as they had been in uh, most of World War I. Um, there's a, a big long list of professional Negro League players who enlisted. Uh, I picked out some of the famous um, uh, there were many more famous ones, uh, Negro League players who, who, who also enlisted and served uh, either in World War II and or both uh, the Korean War. Um, and, and many names that meant nothing to me. So there, you can go online and, and look at, at the lists. Um, but again, they were having to deal with a segregated society. So what's America going to do at home? <clears throat> and FDR signed his famous green light letter in, in 1942 and essentially said, you know, let's keep baseball going. You know, let's, let's keep uh, as many things normal as we can on the home front because he, he's mobilizing the home front and there's all kinds of upheaval there just as there have been in World War I because women are now being brought back into the workforce again. Um, although this time the big difference is that the uh, federal government was um, designating a lot of working male population as essential workers um, 
so they weren't able to um, enlist. Well, they can enlist, but they they weren't going to serve. Um, my dad was was one of those. He wanted to serve in the Navy, but he had a job at the time as a uh, railroad coalman. He was shoveling coal. He was the fireman for a steam locomotive run from Chicago to um, Philadelphia and New York City and back and forth. And he shoveled coal for, for three years during the war because that's what the president wanted him to do. Um, so keep baseball going. And that opens up the door to some pretty interesting um, changes. Women have been playing baseball for a long time. Uh, I think these were, I mean, there's some really great photographs of, of women's teams. How they could play in these uniforms yeah. is beyond me. Um, but there were urban teams, rural teams, and of course, Vassar College was had the first official women's team. That, that's Vassar in, in the center. I love caps. Um, so they, they, women's organized baseball had been around since post-Civil War um, in various parts of, of the country. The photograph on the right is uh, from Colorado. Um, so the, the conversation was, how are we going to play baseball if so much of the male population is either enlisting or has been drafted. Um, so one of the solutions to the problem was to create a women's professional baseball league. Um, hopefully you've all seen the marvelous movie League of Their Own. Mm. I, I, I watch it every year. Um, it, it's just a great film. And, and there's a lot of good facts in, in that. It's not all all fiction, a lot of the fun parallels, truth. Um, and I sent you the list of uh, requirements of the ladies yeah. for you know maintaining their femininity um, in this male dominant sport. Um, and they enforced it um, quite, quite rigidly, quite effectively too. So the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, 1943 to 1954. Uh, again, there's there's some great. Well, they, the GP GPBL has a, an official website. And then there's a dozen or so really interesting interviews. I recommend you go online if this topic interests you and and take a listen. Um, and and a couple of the interviews are of the um, the real people behind the uh, the lead act actresses in uh, a league of their own. Um, yeah. Nicknamed the Lipstick League, the um, Philip Wrigley of the Chicago Cubs uh, was kind of the brains of the operation, although there were other men involved, and I say men, um, and they had tryouts in uh, Wrigley Field, and the goal was to provide entertainment, but to, you know, fill the coffers too of, of the baseball owners um, who were hurting from attendance um, if they are able to continue to, to field teams. A structure organization that paralleled Major League Baseball. Um, plenty of teams and again there was some fluidity with these teams and the dates 1943 to 54 again, a bit fluid. Once the war is over, um, the, the, the days of, of, the heyday of women's professional baseball is, is going to start to wane, obviously. Uh, by 53, 54, they're pretty much hanging on by a thread. Mm. Uh, and, and so the decision is uh, to end it in 54. I love this quote. Um, Femininity is the keynote of our league. No pants, wearing tough talking female okay. softballer will play on any of our four teams. Hmm. Those were the original four. Was that the same Max Carey who played for the Pirates? It is. Wow. Wow. He was a uh, big he was a big star, Hall of Famer. Yep. Yeah, he was uh, he was a key part to the whole organizational structure. 
Um, and, and, then this, and then this one, every day after practice, Mr. Wrigley sent us to Helena Rubenstein's charm school to learn how to put on makeup, how to put on a coat and how to get in and out of a car or a chair. And, and I think one, one of the good things, one of many of the good things that the film shows you, the movie, is the, um, you know, the difference between the country women and, and, the, and the urban women. That would, the yeah. same would be too, true of men, too. Um, but, you know, women who were working on farms and, and joining baseball just to get the hell out of there um, mm -hmm. hadn't been worrying about rouge and lipstick and uh, stockings, probably never owned a pair of stockings, didn't need to, um, just had their Sunday uh, go to meet and dress, and, and that was about it if you lived in, the, in central Kansas, for instance. But they played ball. And uh, many of them were really good, as as the records show. Um, Doc, do you want to uh, pause here? Would you want me to pause here? And do you want to do the poem "Glory"? Well, or do you um, want to wait till the end? I should, you... I should wait till the after the after the the you do this this part of it. Yeah, because well, that's kind of a you know we're a little bit back to um, the Negro Leagues then. Okay, well, I'm, I'm, I'm shifting to the Negro Leagues now. Oh. That's, what, that's why oh. I asked. Oh, okay. So I, you, wasn't, I wasn't aware of the transition, perhaps, because you make it so smooth. So are we going to do... Okay. Yeah, let's do Glory now. Glory was a, a poem that I'd asked you to read last week, and, you know, not surprising we didn't get to it, but it's also one of my favorite... Um, baseball poems. Do you all have it around? Well, we didn't tell them that we were going to do that, so. I understand that. I understand that. Well, I'll read it to you. So if you don't have it, no problema. Just listen carefully. It's written by a guy named Yusef Komanyaka. And he's alive and well and has won the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry, currently teaches at Princeton in the creative writing program. And um, obviously was a great lover or is a great lover of baseball. So this poem primarily is about the folks, the guys who didn't make the Negro Leagues. These are the guys who didn't play every day didn't get paid, but they played every Sunday and they dreamed of being part of the, the Negro Leagues. Okay. So listen for any kind of key words or phrases that are telling you why this poem is called Glory. Most were married teenagers working knockout shifts Daybreak to sunset, six days a week. Already old men playing ball in a field between a row of shotgun houses and the magazine lumber company. They were all Jackie Robinson and Willie Mays, a touch of Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige. In each stance and swing, a promise like a hesitation pitch always at the edge of their lives, arms sharp as rifles. The Sunday afternoon heat flared like thin flowered skirts as children and wives cheered. The men were like cats running backwards to snag pop-ups and high flies off fences, stealing each other's glory. The old deacons and raconteurs who umpired made an out or safe into a song and dance routine. Runners hit the dirt and slid into home plate, cleats catching light as they conjured escape, outfoxing double plays. In the few seconds it took a man to eye a woman upon the makeshift bleachers, a stolen base or home run would help another man survive the next week. Why is it called glory?
called glory because all us old men who still try to play a young man's game try to hold on to that piece that we have that makes us young. Well, you can speak for yourself, Kurt, about the old men, but um, as can I. But these these were married teenagers, right? So it's you're you're kind of getting at the same point, though. I mean, they're they're old in terms of their you know the progress of their lives. There really is no chance that they're going to. Their, their time is gone. As married teenagers, they're done. They've given yeah. up all of their their hopes and dreams as married teenagers. And it says that line three or four. It's already old men. Yes. Which, you know, when you look at what we're sending to college these days as 18 and 19 year olds, heaven forbid, if they're already old men, then there, yeah. there's worry for the world. But this is also the time when these men can shine and they can shine in front of their children and their ladies and their wives and they can slide into the plate and they can hit the ball far. And, you know, this is their moment in the yeah. other drudgery life. Yeah, and, and notice the, you know, the very specific kind of detail of there being shotgun houses. So we are, you know, we're very, very uh, aware of the socioeconomic elements here. Um, and the field is near the magazine lumber company. So, you know, we're not, you know, we're talking about a, a kind of made on the, you know, made on the shift kind of, you know, field um, with these, um, with makeshift bleachers, you know, and yet, you know, it's interesting from the, after he says that where it is, he says they were all Jackie Robinson and Willie Mays, a touch of Josh Gibson and Satchel Paige. So they all had that dream. They were all on the edge of their lives too, Doc, and that's that's the hard part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that wonderful line: "In each stance and swing, a promise, like a hesitation pitch," and that was Sat uh, Satchel Paige's signature pitch. Um, and I, I think uh, last week you saw a picture of him, and he just had these unbelievably long legs and the arms, and he would just sort of be almost in air, his leg lifted up, and then it would go down with the, and, and the fastball would, would follow too. Um, the, the, the poet mentioned Sunday, points out, well, I mean, literally, yeah, that's when these games were played, but did you notice anything else that might make the whole experience almost religious. Because you know that they were, you know, I mean, they came, this was after church that they had the games. So the, the women were still in their Sunday best. Mm -hmm. And the, the children were probably had uh, their shoes shined. Right, and there they were at the, at this dusty ballpark. You know, to piggyback on what Mimi said about the sh you know their moment to shine, the line about the uh, the cleats catching light. Excellent, um, yeah. very good. You know, I think also um, this this celestial opportunity to 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 be with stars. Um, even though they weren't, even though they lived the other six days of the week, a, a life of drudgery and, and, and handwork. Um, you know, it's funny. I know in Philadelphia, there were blue laws and they didn't allow baseball on Sundays, but I wonder if the Negro leagues did, or, or if they were allowed to play on Sundays because no one paid attention. Um, but, I, but I, I was wondering about that Sunday baseball. I'm not sure they're considered professional leagues. Yeah, this uh, this is a, probably a semi-pro at at most. You know, I right? Mean, a, you know, a lot of factories and companies would have their own teams as well, right? Yes. Yeah, and I have a feeling also that this is rural. You know, um, 
But, you know, words like conjured escapes. The idea of conjuring, yeah, it's not religious necessarily, but it's certainly supernatural. Um, even who are the umps? The old deacons of the church and the storytellers, the raconteurs, right? So there is, um, there's that, oh, the, and, and the way they ump is through a, a song and dance. Okay, so there's that, that element of entertainment and glory uh, within the poem. I think that comes up, Doc, also in a lot of the other poems that we've read in prior weeks, just the song and dance or the rhythm of a lot of these and mm -hmm. seeing kind of the game being played kind of as a dance of sorts. Um, I just think that's a theme that we've seen through a lot of these. And and it does tie a little bit to the re religious point you meant, that you made as well. I think like song especially is fairly big in church environments. Um, sure. Maybe it's just the nature of poetry itself, but it does have almost like a rhythmic prayer type element to it in some ways. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's a beautiful poem. I mean, rhythmically, it's beautiful. The way he leads from like um, in the beginning, working knockout shifts, day break to sunsets. I mean, having that, the break in the line, yet you'd have to lead into the next, the next line. Yeah, it's gorgeous, gorgeous poem. I was thinking that um, the um, when people go to church or synagogue, they a lot of people for that it's like an energy boost for them that they get some spiritual lift from going to church or the synagogue and or the uh, mosque. And um, in this poem, um, this was an energy boost for these men that they had these drudgery lives and so much responsibility. But they had this glory, this one day of glory, this one moment of glory that they yes. had that carried them through for the rest of the week. Very good. Yeah. Any other comments on this? It's a good poem. He's a, he's a, he's a really good, good poet. There was one other, Kendall, hi there. Uh, there was one other poem that I did ask you to read, and it's so short that even if you don't have it again, you'll... But I, I thought I'd just give it a quick read. This is the one um, by a guy named Michael Koenig. I have no idea who, the, who he is. I mean, none. I mean, I looked him up, couldn't find anything, but he wrote this really good baseball poem that was very hard to find. But anyway, it's called The Negro League's Day Off. Here, after all, is where we stand, in the middle of a field in Kansas, playing for a percentage of the gate, cash only, 60-40 split. Satch throwing bullets in twilight, two or three games a day. Set up the lights and take them down. Chicken dinner in the colored church, stay in people's homes, two men each. Cap Anson who was a Hall of Famer, is hitting 270 in this league, trying to fight off George Stobie's best pitch. Fleet Walker is laughing behind the plate and calling for more heat. So this gives a, an idea of, okay, so if you had the day off, you actually would play these pickup games or these barnstorming games with white teams. And you would play against people like Cap Anson and Cap Anson in this league the barnstorming league was only hitting 270 that's because he had to deal with George Stovey and, and Satchel Page and um, and there's that wonderful little line about cash only 60-40 split and you know who got the 40% in his um you know, in these games. So anyway. Hey, Doc, I love how it mentions yeah. Kansas uh, at the top of that poem um, mm. because Kansas is figuratively, I guess, and literally the center yes. of the Negro League Baseball. And after everyone here um, gets their shots and, and goes to Cooperstown again to pay homage, um, the Negro League Baseball Museum is in Kansas City. Uh, I think Have you Kansas been there? City. No, I, you know, I follow them on Twitter. The guy who runs it is just a real 
speak about Rock on Tours. He's a real great voice for the, the history of Negro League Baseball. And uh, it seems like a great venue, really. Yeah, it's really so cool. I, su I suggested that, to, that Kendall and I would do a you know, guy trip there. Yeah, you should. It's it's uh, you go go see a Royals game and then go to the yeah, museum. That's... Uh, yeah, the guy's name is Bob Kendrick. He's tremendous. He's just uh, you hear him a lot on MLB radio. Yeah, um, and uh, you know I've quoted him uh, here and there, and, and I met with him, you know, for my book about just some of the great Negro League pitchers, and it's really cool. I mean, there's there's uh, there's actually not a ton of like memorabilia per se. Like they weren't as 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 I guess fastidious as like keeping all the uniforms and, and the baseball from the 500th home run or whatever, but mm. there's a, there's, there's enough of it. And then there's a lot of cool statues and storytelling and everything. It's, it's, it's really cool and a great gift shop too. Yeah. Negro leagues had great caps. Yes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Okay. So um, you're back to you, Kendall. Okay. So um, this was a pause in, in baseball, um, but was pretty popular. I mean, they, they drew 1 million fans in 1948 after the war's over. And as the um, pro men's pro leagues are, are coming back together to a, a level of normalcy. Um, Kendall? Yes. I don't know if you saw that I stopped your screen share when we were having that discussion. Oh, so can't see. Okay, wait a minute. Sorry, I messed you up. Yeah, now I gotta, how do I get back to, oh, wait a minute. There we go. Okay, sorry, I put, I had to put share screen back on. And no, <laughs> just a minute. I don't want to share this. Wait, come on, go away. Hey, Kendall, how about those Mets? <laughs> hey, uh, Doc, yeah. <laughs> so last week, uh, okay, last week um, I was looking down at you, but um, this week um, you're looking at us in the rearview mirror. And I'm having goes a around, heart. comes around. And that's the way it's going to be this whole year. I'm uh, struggling to get I'm sorry. Back, back. Heather, you can't blame yourself. Just take it easy. Share. Let's see, I want to share this, but that's it. Okay, got it. All right. Are we there? Yeah. Okay. It's all right. It's good to get tests. Um, so um, women's league was uh, temporary. It was short. Um, there's some great stories. There was some serious playing. Um, it helped some women to uh, begin to break the barrier of, you know, the assumption that um, women could not play baseball like men. And... Um, they shouldn't have been playing like this. It was not ladylike. And it got a great action shot right there. Mm. Um, but um, they were successful. And um, there, there's, there's some writing that about the early women's movement. And they you know, touch on what took place in the, uh, this professional league as one of the starting points. Mm. Um, but the war's over and um, things are going to get back to normal. Not really. Um, Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey um, is going to cross the color line. He had been a long time known as an innovative general manager, and president of, of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Um, and he was determined to get the stars from the Negro Leagues into Major League Baseball, um, in part for monetary reasons, in part for the good of the sport, and also in part because it was the right thing to do. Um, and uh, Branch Rickey uh, certainly had his own 
crosses to bear, so to speak, and, and was not a perfect man, but none of us are. Um, but he, you know, this was a biggie. And um, he's to be patted on the back for, you know, helping to get this, this whole thing started, uh, regardless of all of his motivations. One, one of, a couple of the motivations being absolutely very good reasons. Um, so <laughs> being innovative, he creates the United States League. And this was going to be his cover story for integrating baseball. Um, so he creates this league, which is pretty much only on paper, mm -hmm. and it allowed him to scout black players. Now, there was no statute that expressly forbade um, integration. It was just the gentleman's agreement that we talked about last time, as well as having Landis as your commission, who was you know, a raging um, racist. Yeah. Um, but Landis is, is going to um, cooperate because he's going to die um, in 1944. So, and that, that's make it uh, politically uh, easier for Ricky to help make this thing happen. And Ricky early on was watching Jackie Robinson, uh, who was a star for the Kansas City Monarchs in 45. Um, this is one of many great Ricky quotes. Uh, Ethnic prejudice has no place in sports and baseball must recognize that truth if it is to maintain stature as a national game. Um, so he's going to sign Robinson in August of, of 45. And even though he signed to the U.S. League, you know, he never plays. And he'll, he'll play for uh, the Dodgers uh, minor league team, the Montreal Royals of the International League in, in 1946. International League, which did exist until last year, Tyler, right? It's when the International League finally went kaput because of the... Yeah, they restructured everything. So, I call that a hostile takeover, maybe? <laughs> pretty much. That's pretty much exactly what it was. They let the agreement uh, expire, and then they just re you know re reshuffled everything the way they wanted it, make it more efficient. So he played for the Montreal Royals, and he, of course, was an instant hit. Uh, Robinson won a batting title and helped lead the team to the league championship um, in his very first year. Ricky helped ease the transition for his move to the big leagues, um, to the Dodgers in 47. He played from 1947 to 1956, first base. He was an outfielder originally. Um, and of course he was an instant success, but um, stirred the controversy because now you've integrated baseball and um, he was certainly going to have his detractors, Robinson, uh, as well as Ricky, for that matter. Um, and things got ugly pretty quickly. Um, this is um, the, the graphic on the left is an actual a photograph of an actual uh, piece of hate mail, um, terroristic threat that Robinson got on a daily basis. Uh, multiple um, threats and um, of course he was having to travel and stay in a separate hotel um, so yes the league was integrated now but society was not integrated and of course this was true not only in the south but in the north in the midwest and the west as well and we have to remember that um, it's too easy for some people today to look at, at um, segregation, racism, and from their seats in Philadelphia or New York City or Boston, Massachusetts or wherever, and see it as a Southern problem. This was a national problem. Um, and Robinson was helping to illustrate that by being the first to help integrate the, uh, the league but also um, 
by the stories that were being produced in, in the papers. And I found this cartoon, and those of you who have been in my other class know I love political cartoons. Uh, I thought it was interesting. It was from the Pittsburgh Courier. As well. I mean, it's 1960. It's after he played, but it still gets at, mm. at the same message here of, of, of the problems of, you know, it was, it was okay for my dad to be on the beaches at Anzio, but uh, somehow I can't, I can't go, get, he can't go into the uh, old Dixie Inn, which of course is appropriately named here. Um, and as I've said before, and, and, and you know that Robin Roberts has too about the um, colored drinking fountains and, and the colored bathrooms and, and, and all that that existed um, throughout the South. But again, Robinson and, and the others who will join him uh, from the Negro Leagues uh, had this, these situations no matter where they were in the country, not just in the South. Oh boy. D Dodgers came to town. Um, any self-respecting Philadelphia Philly fan should know this already, just in case you don't. Um, there's some urban legend and myth around this photograph. Um, I tried to dig out and, and separate the, the, the stories that may or may not be true from, from what we know for sure, we think, is, is accurate. Um, accurate is Ben Chapman, Philly's manager, had um, begun, uh oh, I have a puppy here that, and I'm soloing, I just got attacked, what's the matter? Um, <laughs> I may have to do this fast and then I'll be back. Anyway, uh, so Ben Chapman was manager of the Phillies and, um, <laughs> and um, he, he was a racist. And, and here's my seven month old golden retriever. And you know, you know um, I, I think I out, I'll be right back. I apologize for doing this, but my wife's already in California and I'm soloing it. So I'll be back quickly. Come here, come on. Hot, hot. So Tyler, what can you what can you add about the um, you know the behavior of, of Chapman and the Phillies uh, regarding Robinson? Well, it was it was pretty bad. I mean, um, it's 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 some of it's documented there in, in uh, the movie Forty Two. Yes. Um, trouble checking into a hotel in Philadelphia, and and, and you know Chapman just being a real. Uh, you know, a, a real racist, uh, throwing a lot of insults uh, at Robinson. This photo, I, I, from what I understand, was, um, you know, a, a, a common sort of baseball shot. And, 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 you know, and Jackie just sort of went with it, but, but wasn't really happy about, about doing it. Um, yeah. You know, and, and <laughs> I think it's one of the few times the Phillies are even mentioned in the Ken Burns documentary. Um, from uh 1994 uh, is for their yeah, they didn't they didn't come off very well no they're uh <laughs> you know a regrettable um awful behavior there uh in 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 47. well i don't so, think it was your uh chapman's uh doing as it was herb pennock who was not a southerner he was from kennett square pennsylvania Kenneth square right yeah and he was a, a flaming racist and he was the one that that uh that initiated this uh, stuff about uh, Robinson and the hotel and all that stuff. And Chapman and his coaches were all from Birmingham, Alabama. So it was easy for them mm. to, uh, you know, to hate him. But uh, it wouldn't have happened if Pennock hadn't, uh, hadn't led the way. And why, you know, there's a Hall of Fame, a Yankee Hall of Fame, uh, you know, uh, number one pitcher on the 27 Yankees and a hero. And why... You know where his racism came from. It's uh, it, it's tough to uh, it's tough to try to figure out. But he was the one that uh, that allowed Chapman to do this, which was really bad. I mean, uh, uh, when Kurt Simmons came up in the late end of '47 uh, as a kid, as a rookie, a, a September call up for one month, he sat on the bench and they played the Dodgers, and uh, Chapman threatened to fine him fifty dollars if he didn't. If you didn't get all over Robinson, and uh, wow. that's was in '47. Now '48 changed completely because when my dad came up in '48 in June, 
the word was out, leave Robinson alone because he killed the Phillies. And uh, so he was, uh, he basically was, uh, the, the word was out, do not, uh, do not bother uh, Robinson. So that was just strictly and a Chapman point. was gone by then. No, Chapman was gone in July. You know, okay. Chapman uh, was fired in July and my dad came up in June and okay. uh, the word was then, don't say anything to Robinson, mm -hmm. leave him alone because uh, he just killed the, uh, he just killed the Phillies. But then Robinson was replaced by Eddie Sawyer in, uh, in July of, uh, of 48. Not to veer off topic too much, but maybe Tyler or, or Rob might have insight on this too, but the Phillies were the last National League team to have a black player um, admitted on their team. It was 1957 with a guy named John Kennedy. And you wonder if it had to go even higher. I mean, Bob Carpenter was... Well, Carpenter uh, learned... Uh, Carpenter... Uh, uh, Herb Pennock uh, was uh, uh, was like Branch Rickey in that he was uh, uh, someone who uh, developed the minor. He was one of the first people to think that the minor leagues, you know, he bought Utica. He made that a minor league team, uh, kind of like, uh, and he really helped. And they signed a lot of young kids. But he dropped dead at the winter meetings in 1948. And, uh, and Rob, uh, uh, Carpenter took over the team basically as the general manager because it happens – all of a sudden, and he learned baseball from the knee of Herb Pennock. So, uh, and, you know, he was from Delaware in that, uh, you know, it's not deep south, but uh, so uh, he, he was ingrained in him that don't let the blacks in because it'll ruin the, uh, it'll ruin the attendance and the, the white uh, fans who are your base won't come. And that's basically how they operated. And, and, uh, and poor John Kennedy was their first, but, uh, as my dad said, he couldn't play at all. And, uh, and he was just brought up basically to embarrass the, uh, you know, the black players. And he just basically was on the team only for their barnstorming group to their mm. set north. They used to go north to the, uh, to the Atlantas and the Charlottes and the Richmonds, all those Southern teams that did not have major league baseball. And they would, uh, break spring training and, and take a week to uh, to travel north and play in those teams. And Kennedy played every game for the Phillies at shortstop. And he didn't play well, and he didn't uh, hit the ball well. And then after a, after a, a week, he was gone. And it was, uh, it was just kind of a uh, – it was kind of a joke. The real first uh, black player of any ability the Phillies had was uh, Richie Allen, which was 1964 which is, you know, that's, what is that, 15 years after Robinson? Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really amazing when you think about it because the John Kennedy thing, you're right. Like, I'm looking at his stats. He, he had five games, two at-bats, that's it. And then and then Dick Allen, Richie Allen, wasn't until, what, 64, right? So, you know, the Phillies, is, for all purposes, were essentially the last team to integrate. They well, my dad... A quick story. My dad was signing autographs down at Andy Semenik's uh, college down in um, Melbourne, Florida. And uh, he said he was in, uh, people were in line. And all of a sudden he looked up and there was John Kennedy. And this was like uh, 2000. And he said, whatever happened to you? Yeah. <laughs> uh. <laughs> he hadn't seen him, you know, since 56 or 57, whatever it was. And then all of a sudden he looked up and there he was. He said, wow. Hey. Uh. Seen him since, uh, that he just disappeared. Let's back wow. up to 1960. Hello? You had the Kurt Flood trade, and yes, the Kurt Flood trade was in part all about free agency, but it was also, I mean, Flood made it very clear I'm not going to the Phillies. It's the most racist yeah. team there was. I mean, everybody knew that. He knew it, and he was not going to play for the Phillies uh, in part because of their reputation. And that was before Dick Allen. So. Well, they sent, they sent Dick Allen to Little Rock. I mean, uh, and this is 19, what, 62, 63, where, you know, Little Rock was the, uh, was the fire point of the entire civil rights movement. And, uh, and that was, uh, you know, you just didn't, you just shouldn't have done that to, to, to a kid like that from, from uh, Western Pennsylvania, who uh, really wasn't, wasn't prepared for that. I think it affected him his whole, uh, his whole life. No doubt. Okay, Kendall, to clarify something, and I'll, add, I'll defer to Robin and all of the guys who may know this. Weren't the Red Sox the last team to integrate? 
Officially, yeah. They were the last team to have a black player. Okay. I just, I just wanted to make sure because I, I had this discussion and argument with my father a couple, of year, a couple of weeks ago, and he was adamant that it was the Red Sox and not the Phillies, despite all the things that he lived through in the 60s in Philadelphia. Yeah, they were officially the last team. Okay, moving on here. So we have time for Doc's poems. Um, so obviously Hall of Fame career, uh, 47 Rookie of the Year. Uh, they led the league in stolen bases, 47 and 49. Led second baseman in double plays, 49-52. Career batting average, 311. And of course, the first black player to make it to the Hall of Fame. Um, he reshaped baseball. Um, he's the pioneer, and uh, he paid dearly for it um, with all the abuse while he was playing. But even afterwards, um, he... He became a civil rights leader. Um, wasn't something that he originally wanted to do. Didn't think he was, you know, the right person for it. And he certainly picked his spots, but uh, he served his country well. And, and of course, he did during World War II as well. I also find it interesting on that Hall of Fame plaque that you show there. They um, they updated it a few years ago, which they had never done, as far as I know, but. If you, if you read that plaque, it says nothing about breaking the color barrier, nothing about the context of, of his career. They give four and a half lines to his, his records for second baseman and making double plays. But there's nothing about, no. you know, what he had to endure or breaking the color barrier. So a few years, a few years ago, they redid all the text and uh, gave a little more history into what, why he, you know, his biggest contribution. A little more, a little more significant than the double plays record in nineteen. Mm, yeah. So, the show. Yeah, I just said I had this, when he was inducted. It was still something sort of like a, you know, something baseball didn't really want to really acknowledge or 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 highlight. I guess. I have to. I just had this 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 sort of mini moment of enlightenment, and they happen so rarely. But was there a guy? Was the first african-american to play for the red sox a guy named pumpsy green pumpsy green I, you're who, correct who uh, i i saw play for the mets at the polo ground <laughs> wow pumpsy green yeah he just died pumpsy here he was i think he was a switch hitter second baseman you were right peter you Thanks. deserve a table slap for that i'll, I'll give myself a table <laughs> slap All right Okay, moving on here. So, absolutely one of my favorite players, um, Hammer and Hank. Um, what a guy, what a career. Um, and, you know, he follows in, in the footsteps of Robinson, uh, comes in a little later, um, started with the Indianapolis Clowns, but because integration was already moving along, um, it didn't take him quite as long to get noticed and be bumped up. Um, that's his rookie card there. I thought that was cool. So, I mean, you could fill two slides with um, all of his accomplishments. Uh, he's just amazing, um, the longevity alone, but just what he does and, um, you know, I, you, everyone remembers where you were in 9-11. Everyone knows where you were in, in some of the other horrific events that, you know, we've lived through. Um, I remember where I was when I saw him hit 715. Um, that was a special, yep. special time uh, for any baseball fan. And uh, I think they cut in even on regular TV shows because uh, there wasn't a sports network back in those days. Um, but when you look what he accomplished, <laughs> Um, it's just on fire. I mean, how many better players than Henry Aaron are there? Not many, in my opinion. Um, I know all that is subjective, but for me, he's, he's one of the greatest. And uh, I had to put this in, being the Phillies fan. <laughs> His only inside the park home run was against Bunning. And I noticed today on Twitter, Twitterverse, that – I don't know why, but it was in there today, and a whole bunch of different people were commenting on on the on his in the inside the park home run. Maybe it was because it was on this day or something. I'm not sure. But um, and talk about abuse. Um, yes, Robinson got it. Uh, Henry Aaron got it. He got it more because he played longer. Um, and the death threats, you know, when he was going to break, break Babe Ruth's 
um, record and all that were just horrific. And he lived through that, all of that. Uh, I don't need to read through these statistics. Um, you can see them. Um, but it, so, I mean, it was just amazing. And what, what a quote, um, Babe Ruth never had to contend with anything like that when he was establishing his record. So true. Um, different era, sure, different ball, um, but he, no one had the abuse that uh, the black players had, but especially Henry Aaron, since he was taking on a, a sacred number. And he did it without PEDs. Robin, did your dad ever t ever tell you about what it was like to face uh, Aaron or, or Jackie? Uh, Aaron was the, uh, well, first, my dad against Jackie Robinson, my dad, uh, by a long shot, pitched more at bats. He got more hits, more home runs, more RBIs, more everything against my dad because my dad <laughs> never made the Dodgers. You know, the Dodgers were basically a right handed team, and a pitcher like Kurt Simmons was kept away from the Dodgers because all I had was Snyder and uh and my dad pitched you know every every time so he he uh you know he had, of course and Aaron my dad said Aaron's the best the best hitter by far he ever saw I mean just uh, uh he hit line drives that uh that you thought were singles and they went over the fence he was so strong and uh he was uh, uh but he was you know those guys with the with the wrists and uh, like, like Mays and Aaron and Ernie Banks. Uh, they're the ones that gave my dad the most trouble. The big swingers, my dad could get them out pretty easy. But the, the guys with the short, strong swings, uh, they murdered my dad. Yeah, I, I see. Uh, the record shows you're absolutely right. Uh, Jackie Robinson had more plate appearances, twenty more plate appearances against Robin Roberts than against any other pitcher, and well, he had not he had nine homers off. Off Robin, um, you know, he only had five off of anybody else. So, including he, one uh, in '51 yep. uh, that uh, they'll never, they would have never heard the shot were heard around the world if he hadn't hit that that last game of the season to 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 get into the playoff mm. with the Giants. Wow! Oh yeah, look at that! Yeah. Right in the 14th, the 14th inning. Oh my god! The 14th inning. <laughs> the 14th inning. My dad had pitched the day before, and they brought him in. <laughs> Eighth, and he pitched from the eighth through the fourteenth. Oh, God. that's amazing! God, I love baseball back then. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. yeah, this is great. I love all the repartee. Uh, Robin, Robin's uh, my old, Robin's my old uh, summer league baseball coach. By the way, remember that? Right. <laughs> that's right. You were the only guy I had that could get it over the plate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. I didn't You're throw very fast, fast, but I could, I could throw strikes. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, I hope you have more stories like that next week when we uh, put uh, Tyler on the hot seat all the whole period. So think about that, Robin. Okay, I was going to wax poetically here. I'll keep this short. Um, no, just go ahead. Yeah, because we, we got to get to your poems. I don't want to cheat you. Um, the, okay. I'll listen. The, they're, one of the poems isn't very good, okay. but it's it's you know don't just go. Don't worry. So my concluding remarks, because there won't be um, history per se, well, there'll be history because we're going to talk about Tyler's book, but in, in, a, in a different venue. But um, so yeah, I'm a history teacher, uh, uh, 43 years worth. Um, every year of my teaching, uh, I, I, I knew I was convinced that race was at the center of everything we studied and what we did and what we liked and what we disliked. Um, whether you're talking politics, whether you're talking economy, you're talking domestic policy, foreign policy, race and ethnicity are there and they don't go away despite some people trying to make it go away. Um, and, you know, this last two years, we've been caught up in this, in my opinion, stupid fight. I mean, in some ways it's a good fight, but um, between those promoting the 1619 Project, which came out of the New York Times, and it uh, raised the whole question about um, race again and um, the role that slavery played in the formation of, of this country. Um, and um, in our former president's um, last year, he uh, promoted, or his um, Mr. Miller promoted, I'm not sure who, the 1776 Commission, which um, was going to 
literally whitewash um, the ideas coming out of the 1619 project and this debate that has gone on and it's still going on uh, between those who advocate 1619 project and versus the 1776 commission um, is a distraction. I mean, it's good to have this debate, but um, at the heart of this whole thing is that race has always been with us. Um, it's always going to be with us um, and, and ethnicity and it brings out the, the good and the bad in, in, in all of us in all of our history. And um, everybody's story matters, um, regardless of your color, regardless of your race, regardless of your religion. Um, that's what has made the United States a great country, um, but with our problems. But, but history is not complete without the good, the bad, and the ugly. You can't cherry pick and just, you know, Look at all the positive things that white people did in, in the United States history, beginning with the Constitutional Convention, moving forward and, and decry that people are talking about the civil rights movement or slavery. Uh, when, it, when did slavery begin? Uh, when did it end? Some, there was a, a member of the Tennessee state legislature who was making an argument last week that... Um, that the Jim Crow laws were actually the foundation for this equal rights movement, the civil rights movement, which of course is just, you can make those arguments when no one knows their history. And, and this is why I taught, um, because you have to know your history, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, history doesn't repeat itself, but it can help to point the way in which we want to proceed. And one of my favorite historians these days, Annette Gordon-Reed, who's an amazing professor of both law and history, uh, unusual uh, to have both of those at, at Harvard. Um, two little quotes from her. History is a combination of good and bad. It's always easier to spot other hypocrisies while missing our own. Um, she's a black woman yeah. uh, from Texas. And she just published her latest it's kind of a semi memoir. It's a short piece, about 160 pages called Juneteenth. Um, it's very interesting. Um, so yes, all this talk of the Negro Leagues, um, in inclusion of women in, for a short period in, in Major League Baseball, so to speak, um, it all matters um, and everyone plays a role and we have, we have to be inclusive. And uh, race is, is always going to be an issue um, and People like to exploit it for whatever purposes, um, but we need to recognize it. We need to deal with it. Um, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is a great country. Um, we're flawed. We are all flawed. We're all imperfect. And we have to accept those things and strive to be better. I sign off, Doc, it's all yours. Well, thanks, Kendall. Um... A little coda here, um, which actually speaks to some of what you've just been saying. And I'm not sure how much the, the movie 42 sugarcoated it, but I think I've read enough to know that Pee Wee Reese, who was a, you know, arguably a racist um, uh, shortstop for the Dodgers, um, embraced robinson over the years and they became very close um in the in the picture that you showed earlier kendall he was the second from the left um he wasn't the guy with the hand on on uh jackie robinson i'm not sure who that was but Wee reese really uh i think changed from what i've read uh changed the culture of the dodgers to the point where they had better accept Robinson, you know, or their their time was not, you know, their time was going to be limited with that team. Now, um, I'm going to say this for you, Kendall, because um, next week is Tyler's time. So if you have questions that you would like to ask um, Tyler, please send them along to Kendall, okay? And, 
and then um, I'll sort of moderate the discussion. Um, I'm trying to think of like questions that would be impossible for Tyler to answer. Oh, I've already got a couple. I'm ready. All right. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, Look, but, looking but forward please, to getting multiple grades from you, Doc. The the, the A minus slash B okay. plus when you couldn't make up your mind. So yeah. You know what? You you say I couldn't make up my mind, but let's just say I gave you that grade out of kindness. <laughs> Tyler, we call that you, you know you deserve the B plus, but I decided make him feel a little better. Make I little like the kid. It'll like really it. go down as a B plus, but you'll you'll humor me. That's the idea. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> just, Doc, that, that's some weak sauce. <laughs> I know that's weak sauce. I know that's weak sauce, but I live. I live a world of a world of in a world of ambiguity. <laughs> Don't we all? Okay. So anyway, um, oh Tyler, you know I, that I really love the the article on uh, on Henry Aaron, and it was it was. I wanted to ask you a question even before the you know the poems because I always I'm always interested in seeing how you make choices, how a writer makes choices you know you have a certain limitation in terms of space right. right so why did you decide to focus on a couple of former players you know, to, as as the sort of commenters on him oh uh, well it was just sort of the the, the people who um you know who who I could I I could get on a moment's notice kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, but I, I I thought Reggie would be good just knowing Reggie over the years, um, and knowing how how reverential he 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 feels toward towards Hank Aaron number forty four the whole thing, um, I thought he would be I thought Reggie would be a good voice for that. Um, because in big moments, it's kind of like when he played, like in big mm -hmm. moments, Reggie mm -hmm. loves to be sort of part of the story. Yeah. Um, he's pretty, he's pretty available for topics like, like this. So, um, and also, I mean, you know, Reggie's 70 in his mid seventies now. So, you know, he's, he, these are all peers of his. Yes. Uh, and Palmer, um, I've gotten to know very well, um, you know, he'll just text me sometimes, just randomly, um, and uh, just a great guy, uh, very uh, insightful, smart, and remembers everything. Um, and Tori the same way. So, you know, I, I covered Joe with the Yankees for, for a bunch of years, and, and Joe could speak to, you know, the um, just, you know, the, uh, Joe's just so smart, and he, he gets exactly what you're looking for, and he knows just how to deliver it. Um, so that was something that broke in the morning, um, and I was actually out for a run. And so when I got back, I, I was kind of able to think about it on the mm -hmm. run. And then when I came back, I, I just got Reggie out in California, and then Joe and Palmer. Um, and I figure when you had three guys like that, Oh, and I got Dale Murphy too, um, who I knew from back in the GA days uh, when he played for the Phillies. I got to know yes. him real well. Um, and Murphy, not a Hall of Famer, but he's a, a legendary brave. Um, and I know Dale's very well spoken, and 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 he could sort of speak to, um, you know, Aaron from from not being a teammate, but just from someone who played in Atlanta and who who mm -hmm. figure would be very familiar with 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 Hank. Yeah, you kind of put out all. The Bunch of calls. Like, oh, I called Ripken that day. I didn't get him. I called someone else. I didn't get him. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I got those four people. I just thought it was a really nice – it was a nice selection. I mean, it, it melded well. And this is this is actually a compliment, Tyler. Thank you. You, you Thank know, you. I mean, no. I mean, you put all of the things together beautifully in that, in that article. I, w I would point out as easygoing as, as, as Tyler – uh, seems right now um, it's fairly remarkable uh, and it speaks to him that he's able to get uh, Reggie Jackson, Joe Torrey, Dale Murphy, I think Chipper Jones was in there on on the phone um, in a few hours notice. That's uh, 
the degree of difficulty there is 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 pretty high. So that's that says something about Tyler. Well, thanks. Yeah, Chipper was on a on a brave Zoom, but the others I, I was able to get. But you know, you also know that when something like this happens, um, when someone like Hank Aaron dies, people expect to people are thinking about him anyway, and it's uh, they almost expect you know to to be called, or they they understand why you're calling, and, yeah. and usually they're you know they're 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 good about um, remembering the the good. Well, he was so much. He was such a gentleman. But he was so much fun too. I mean, he was, you yeah. know, uh, at the, you know, up in Cooper. He didn't come to Cooperstown that often, but when he did, he was just, uh, he was just fun. You could really play with him, and uh, and 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 and. Uh, uh, but he was such a such a gentleman that uh, is uh, my favorite home run of Aaron's was in seventy. Well, the year after Carlton won twenty seven games. Uh, it was Aaron's last year with the Braves. And he came into Philadelphia late April, early May, whatever it was. And Carlton was had been unhittable, you know, the year before. And he started off unhittable in, in the next year, even though he had a bad year. But uh, in the beginning, he was firing. And, and Aaron came up, two out in the first inning. And first pitch, he smoked it right into the – right over the uh, left field fence, right down the line. And the whole place – in Philadelphia, gave him a standing ovation as he went around that. As he went around yeah. the base. really at that because it was just so uh, so perfect. Oh, that's so cool. Well, he would go. He'd be go. He would go beyond. Like in other words, it's like what my grandfather said: you can't boo Willie Mays. No, you know yeah. you can't. You can't boo Henry Aaron, right? I mean, you you got to cheer for him. You got to. If you're well, a yeah, fan. I boo at him, though, unfortunately. What's that? A lot of people did boo. And oh, I know him. that. I know that. Yeah. But you're right. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to do the Jackie Robinson palming. So I, I noticed that. I, I'm really glad that I went to other people other than me um, to get your insights. But um, we'll just look at the short poem by Lucille Clifton called Jackie Robinson. She's a, a really good poet, African-American poet, twice a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for poetry, never won it. It's, it's sort of like being a Mets fan, you know? <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, she was encouraged and supported by Ishmael Reed, and she really got her break when Langston Hughes um, noticed a few of her poems, and then he anthologized them in uh, his volume called The Poetry of, of the Negro, which was back in the, I think, the late 50s, early 60s. So she's very good, and she was a, a quite a quite a, a, an, an Orioles fan, actually. She um, spent a good deal of her life in uh, Baltimore when she was the Poet Laureate of Maryland. So anyway, here it is, Jackie Robinson. And again, look for the you know, look for those key words. There's some that just sort of dart at you. Ran against walls without breaking in night games. Was not foul, but brave as a hit over white stone fences. Entered the conquering dark. So, are there any any comments about that? I wasn't expecting that that photo to show up. Um, I was waiting. Yeah, who who, who did the who, who made the sculpture of you? That's what I. Kendall Grisala. Kendall Grisala. Yeah. Um, well, um, if no one's going to talk, I've never I've never been a shy about talking myself. So anyway. Um, the walls come to mind. The walls. I'll jump, are, in. I'll hmm? jump in if you want. I was thinking um, the first two lines actually just kind of struck me as like his life in a nutshell mm -hmm. of running against walls without breaking where he had such a struggle to try and do what he wanted to do and it was constant 
that that it just like sums up at least I should say his baseball career but most likely you know most of his life that that he's constantly having to like run up against um people trying to stop him from trying to to do what he wants to do and yet he keeps going and keeps running through it and pushing it and is able to get past um really a lot in in yeah I mean it's you know this is a you know sort of a metaphorical and simile filled um bonanza here this uh the poem um and then first of all white stone fences i've never been sure like what 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 she's driving at there white stone fences is she talking about you know the white people that stood against him that were like stone that didn't want him to be there i mean that's very good yeah out of the ballpark but you know, people who were like stone and were never going to change how they felt about him, no matter how great he was. Yeah, I think so. I, but w- I guess what I'm looking for is the literal. I think you, you nailed the, the metaphorical, right? The white stone fence. But what's the white other kind of white stone fence? Somebody's ball. Do you know if any of the ballparks have a white stone fence? That. Well, I mean, I can, I can remember when I was at, you know, when I grew up and went to the Yankee Stadium, it always seemed so white to me. I mean, in many ways, but it, it was I, the color I associate with it is white. So that's the closest I could even make a make a comparison. Anybody else have any idea why it would be white stone fences? Doc, is there the possibility that the white stone is when when you think of a fence, you think of you know, whether it's white picket or you know, post and rail, you're thinking of wood. However, right. in this case, a stone fence, something yeah. that's almost unbreakable. Yeah. And yet he ba- and, and and to the to the point that he's been doing this his entire life, and yet he is the one who has never broken. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. And then that fits nicely as as he entered the conquering dark. Mm-hmm. The conquering dark. Okay, we ready to roll? Good seeing you guys. And next Great week, book. remember, read the book K by Tyler Kepner. Uh, Kendall and I are expecting a small commission, nothing major. Tyler, I got it. I already that- bought it. Excellent. Excellent. All right. I'm holding up a copy for everybody. Stay tuned for next week. Excellent. Excellent. My God, you've got your, you got your this advertisers on flight. This was a Father's Day present in 2019. All it's right. First edition. Unsigned. I'll ask. Oh, I'm happy to sign it. Send it on I'm up. I'm sure you are, Tyler. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we'll hey, see. How do you think I killed time in, in Doc's class? I would just practice my autograph instead of listening to it. <laughs> Kendall, That's why I didn't get a straight A. Kendall, the, the, the a your slash. jollity is, is a little bit overdone, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to say good night to everybody. It's been fun right, again. And we'll see you guys uh, next week. Thanks. Good to see, see you, Coach. Hey. See you, everyone. That book that you wrote, uh, my dad's uh, contribution was two, was two uh, chapters. Basketball. Yeah. <laughs> I got him in there, right. <laughs> Basketball yeah. curve, that was all you needed. You didn't need you all know, that other uh, knuckle curve and all that other stuff. Uh, that's how you pitch 300 innings six, six years in a row. Yeah, oh, my God. You don't see that anymore. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> all right, see you later, everybody. Hey, everybody, yeah. take care.